I don't know about y'all, but I get a particular joy every time I see the malicious plans of those with bad intentions fall apart. And there's a very special place in my heart when those malicious plans fall apart because those with bad intentions don't understand the very thing they think they're attacking. Speaking of which, there are now two seasons of the Rings of Power in the bag. <laughs> Failure? Way too many failures to keep track of. I want to focus on one in particular, though. The failure to assassinate Galadriel. Make no mistake, the writers of the Rings of Power's goal from day one was to assassinate Galadriel, to destroy the very things that made her a beloved character for generations. Us architect types are taught to never think about anything in isolation. We've been taught to take a step back, look at the world as a whole, and then try to find patterns that repeat themselves. And then ask the question, what are the underlying assumptions that cause these patterns to repeat themselves sometimes over and over and over again? So let's look for some patterns and examine some assumptions, shall we? I can't act so I cast. Why would the writers of the Rings of Power set out to destroy Galadriel? <laughs> Academic and corporate feminism, yes, I'm being redundant, hate Galadriel. They have wanted to sink their claws into her, destroy her for a long time. There's the now famous interview where Charlie Rose attempted to call Peter Jackson out on the carpet. Why didn't you get rid of the problematic elements of Tolkien? Update the messaging. This is where Jackson gave what I consider to be a brilliant answer. No, no, no. We're not interested in bringing our baggage, our messaging to Tolkien. We wanted to honor Tolkien by presenting his message. Yeah, 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 Randy. Everybody knows about that interview. Who cares? Well, let me ask you this. What were the problematic elements of Tolkien that needed to be removed? And what were those elements supposed to be replaced with? We have to go back to the late 90s, early 2000s, early days of the internet. And when Hollywood got their first inkling, the Tolkien fandom's a little different. There started to be dark rumors circulating around this new thing called the internet in chat groups and forums. Hey, you know about that movie that they're making down in New Zealand? That Lord of the Rings thing? Yeah, Jackson et al. and his writers are making major changes to Tolkien's story. A major backlash started to grow. Now remember, this is the early days of the internet. Hollywood corporations barely knew the internet existed. They had no clue how to handle such a backlash. And on top of that, an entire studio's future depended upon the success of these films. Their reaction? They panicked. Liv Tyler was sent out to The Tonight Show and the whole late night circuit. Her purpose? To reassure everybody, relax, relax. Don't worry, folks. We're doing Tolkien right. We're not making any major changes. So get excited. Go to the movies. Give us your money. Why Liv Tyler, of all people, was sent out to reassure everybody? She's a lovely lady, seems nice enough, comes off as very charming in interviews. But why didn't Peter Jackson himself go out, make the rounds, calm everybody down? We go back to those dark rumors floating around the internet. Leaks supposedly coming directly from the film set claimed Arwen, Liv Tyler's character, was going to have a much bigger role in the story. In fact, she was going to fight the Nazgul. Liv Tyler reassured everyone, no, 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 Arwen is not fighting Nazgul. That would be silly. Arwen is not being portrayed as a warrior. That's not who she is. Now, Arwen is going to have a bigger role, but hear me out. All she's going to do is help Frodo out a little bit along the way. We now know Liv Tyler and everybody else involved lied. The original plans were to have Arwen fight the Nazgul. We've uncovered the problematic elements of the Lord of the Rings. Academic and corporate feminists, I'm not going to make the joke, although it is true, 
academic and corporate feminists hate the way Tolkien portrayed women. Wait a minute, Randy. In the books, there are three important women. Arwen is a princess who becomes a queen, and she's very important to the story because she influences Aragorn and Elrond. Galadriel is a queen. She is one of the three most powerful beings on the side of light in all of Middle-earth, and her importance to the story is incalculable. Eowyn is also a princess who just might become a queen in her own right. She has a hand in killing the Witch King, the second most powerful being on the side of darkness in all of Middle-earth. Simply put, no Eowyn, the good guys may not win. We have three powerful women, liked and respected, socially and politically powerful, playing key roles in the story. What's the problem here, Randy? The wrong type of power, my friend. Eowyn, Arwen, and in particular Galadriel represent traditional feminine power. And if there's one thing that academic corporate feminists hate more than anything else, it's traditional feminine power. In Western civilization, going back to the Greeks, it has been believed that men protect culture and women nurture and preserve culture. And it's through women's nurturing and preserving culture that allows them to civilize men. Academic and corporate feminists love this power, but they resent the fact that this power, their social position, their very safety is dependent upon other women. Other women who wield far more power, and it's not coincidental, are far more attractive. The simplest way to put it, academic and corporate feminism comes out of a hatred of femininity, a hatred of women. They're misogynist. Their solution to the problem? They only recognize one legitimate form of power, masculine power. Who in all of literature, movies, pop culture is considered one of the greatest examples of traditional feminine power and she's described as being beautiful to boot and people, men and women all over the world love and adore her? Galadriel. As far as academic and corporate feminists are concerned, that bitch gotta go. The writers of the Rings of Power declared their intentions before season one even started. This is also when they screwed the pooch, doomed their project to failure before it even began. Are you all familiar with the Icy Shrine, a Shinto temple in Japan that they tear down every 20 years and rebuild with all new material? The question that is often asked, once you rebuild the building with all new materials, is it still the same building? I would argue it is the same building. There's more to architecture than just its materiality. There's space, experience, symbolism, just to name three. If everything stays the same, including the materials being used, it doesn't matter. It's still the same building. But we're talking about degrees here. Trying to find that exact moment something stops being one thing and becomes another. What do you all think would happen the next time this building was tore down and rebuilt? It now looked like an auto body shop. Do you think the worshippers would say, yeah, yeah, close enough? Or do you think they'd pull out their pitchforks and torches? At a certain point, we're no longer debating degrees. We're talking about counterfeits, frauds, cons, lies. In the books, Galadriel is described as being incredibly tall, statuesque. I mean, she's six foot two after all, and she has a beauty that could render grown men speechless. In the Jackson adaptations, Galadriel was portrayed by Kate Blanchett. And I don't think there's too many people who are going to argue that Kate Blanchett isn't a good looking woman. You combine Kate's natural beauty with hair, makeup, costume, lighting, cinematography, and you get an elegant, ethereal beauty. The Rings of Power decided to go in a very different direction when they cast Morfid Clark as Galadriel. In my professional opinion, Morfid Clark is a good-looking woman, but she has problems. Right off the bat, she's barely over five foot, and like many petite women, 
She has delicate features. It's going to be very hard for her to pull off ethereal and elegant, and in particular, to pull off stately statuesque elf. On the other hand, with hair, makeup, lighting, costumes, cinematography, you can do a lot. Create all sorts of illusions. Oh, well, so much for that idea. Unfortunately for Morphid Clark, her casting gave away the agenda, told us exactly what was going on. I stand by my statement that Morphid Clark is a good-looking woman. But have no doubt about it, she falls on the androgynous end of the spectrum, starting with her figure. Bluntly put, no hips, no boobs. She has a minimal hourglass figure. Her facial features could also belong to a very pretty man. Oh, come off it, Randy. In the very picture that you've chosen to show us, she has curves. No, it's an optical illusion. Black dress, weight on back leg, front leg forward aimed at the camera, hips three quarters onto the camera, shoulders back squared to the camera, that curve isn't from her waist, it's mostly from the small of her back. She's using every trick in the book to try to make it look like she does have curves. It doesn't matter what Morphid Clark looks like in real life. The show did everything in their power to downplay her appearance, to minimize her feminine beauty to the point they uglified her. Right off the bat, the Rings of Power have a fundamental problem. On one hand, the audience already has their preconceived ideas of what Galadriel should look like. Beautiful, feminine, ethereal. And on the other hand, they're being presented with the Rings of Power's new interpretation of Galadriel. Androgynous, masculine, and harsh. She's scruffy, dirty even. If you tried to make a Venn diagram laying out all the different visual characteristics of both Galadriels, there would be no overlap. These are two very different people, or elves. In of itself, there is nothing wrong with changing the appearance of an existing character. Your story, your rules, you can do whatever you want. But there's a catch. You're playing with fire whenever you start to mess around with people's preconceived ideas of existing characters. You better bring the goods, tell a compelling story, or the audience will turn on you in a heartbeat. As far as the audience is concerned, the Rings of Power already have two strikes against them, and we don't even know anything about the story yet. So what's the very next thing the Rings of Power decides to do? Unveil a photo shoot. Whoever came up with the concept of this picture, and more importantly, whoever allowed this image to ever see the light of day, burnt the rings of power to the ground before it ever even got started. Guaranteed the audience would turn on Morphid Clark, never accept her as a Gladriel, and guaranteed that the assassination attempt of Gladriel would fail. This image is supposed to portray Gladriel as a powerful warrior woman. It doesn't do that. Instead, it projects aggression and hostility towards the viewer, the audience. Whenever you have the subject of an image looking directly into the camera, the viewer interprets the message, the symbolism of that image, to be aimed at them personally. In real life, if you encounter somebody with Morphid Clark's body language holding a deadly weapon, staring at you with the intensity that Morphid Clark is staring at the camera, you face the real possibility of imminent violence. You feel the same levels of aggression and hostility that are being aimed at you. Fight or flight kicks in. You are now prepared to meet violence with violence. Men, especially men who've been civilized by a woman, do not like the feelings of aggression, hostility, and a willingness to commit violence that is triggered by this image. We do not like to have those feelings aimed at a woman. We find this image repugnant almost on an instinctual level. This is why I brought up E.C. Temple in Japan. We are no longer debating a matter of degrees here. When they rebuilt the temple, did they raise the roof line a foot? Did they move the front door six inches to the right? No. 
When they tore down the wood temple, they replaced it with a glass and steel auto body shop. The two buildings are not the same. They have nothing in common. You can call the auto body shop EC Temple all day long. Doesn't mean anybody's going to buy what you're selling. The moment this image was released, Morphid Clark was not Galadriel. And whatever went on in the Rings of Power was not Tolkien. Details, details. As far as the writers of the Rings of Power were concerned, it was full steam ahead. But it wasn't smooth sailing. Yes, I'm mixing my metaphors. They realized they had their own problem, an ideological problem. Academic and corporate feminism are the ones who came up with intersectional theory, intersectional feminism. They may have wanted to assassinate Galadriel, but she's still a woman, so they can't portray her in a negative light ever, and she always has to be right at all times, and she still has to be shown to be in a superior position to men at all times. Quite a tall order. In season one, they tried to take the easy way out. They just wanted to show her as hyper-masculine, the best, baddest warrior in all of Middle-earth. They made Galadriel commander of the northern armies, swaggering around in armor, hunting Sauron for a thousand years in the name of vengeance, climbing ice walls, killing trolls in under 10 seconds. She's harder, tougher, stronger, more stoic than any man. In fact, the men under her command are whining and complaining, We want to go home! We want to go home! High King Gilgalad tells Galadriel, Chill out, girl. You're getting a little obsessive. I think you need a break. I'm going to send you off to our equivalent of heaven. Galadriel's like, forget you, king. No one tells Galadriel what to do. And to prove my point, I'm going to swim the entire length of an ocean. Once Galadriel gets to Numenor, she roughs up everybody she comes into contact with. She tells everybody, including the Queen Regent, exactly which train station they can get off at. But yet, somehow, some way, when the plot calls for it, she's put in charge of training recruits for the army. Because she's the best qualified, of course. Once Galadriel gets into battle, she is a one-woman slaughtering machine, killing orcs like Shiva herself. And Galadriel can take a pyroclastic flow to the face like... Well, I really don't know of any equivalent. So I guess like Galadriel herself. And then there's Galadriel's relationship with Sauron. Whew. The writers very much wanted to have Galadriel meet and interact with Sauron. This would accomplish two very important goals. First, they want to push the narrative, there's no such thing as good and evil. It's all based upon your perspective. This allows them to pull Galadriel down a notch or two. She's not as good as you think she is. I mean, look at all this questionable stuff she does. This also allows them to portray Sauron in a sympathetic light. He's not evil. He's just misunderstood. Look, he has feelings. The second purpose, it furthers the assassination attempt. If they can show Galadriel interacting with Sauron... That means a lot of the evil that Sauron does, that can be put at Gladriel's feet as well. Lady of Light, my butt. More like Lady of Murky Gray. They're still stuck with their ideological problem, though. Gladriel can't be portrayed negatively. She has to be always right, and she has to be superior to Sauron. There is one more ideological issue we need to address. Academic and corporate feminism believes all human interactions are nothing more than power exchanges, and they believe it's a zero-sum game. For somebody to gain power, somebody else has to lose power. As far as these feminists are concerned, sexuality is just another power exchange with a clear winner and a clear loser. Now cross-reference that with the other ideological issue. A woman can never be portrayed negatively, she always has to be right, and she always has to be in a dominant position to a man. The writers want Gladriel and Sauron to hook up, 
but it has to be on Galadriel's terms. She has to be the dominant one in the relationship. And when it's all said and done, she has to be the one that comes out the other side with all the power. We're back to Galadriel swimming across the ocean when she runs into a raft that just so happens to have Sauron on it. Now, this is a settled thing, but it goes to show you a woman has to be in a superior position to a man at all times. Sauron is the first one to talk to Gladriel, but when it comes to her getting on the raft, it's a woman who helps her up. If Sauron helped Gladriel up onto the raft, that would put her in an inferior position. Can't have that. All through season one, every single interaction between Gladriel and Sauron, Gladriel's the dominant one, the aggressor. She's constantly bossing, ordering, browbeating, cajoling. It was her idea to make the rings. It was her idea how many rings to make. It was her dagger that was the key component in making the rings. Every step along the way, Sauron keeps saying, no, no, I don't want any part in this. No, I don't think this is a good idea. And Galadriel keeps saying, shut up and do what you're told. See, Sauron's really not evil. He was forced into it. Don't get confused, though. Galadriel's not wrong. Because, you see, she did everything for the right reasons. At some point during the season, the writers were going to have Gladriel and Sauron hook up. Get it on. But they were smart enough to realize they couldn't just have them take their clothes off and start bumping uglies a la Game of Thrones style. They had to be a little more subtle. So they went with symbolism. In episode 8, you have the weird mind illusion scene where the two of them are on a raft together. You have all these water metaphors, the ocean, the waves, drowning, dying, and at the end, coming back to life. Rising waves, drowning, the little death, rebirth. These are all classic metaphors for female orgasm. Sauron places Gladriel's hand on his dagger. And if you don't get the symbolism already, check out the location and angle of the dagger. Galadriel then uses Sauron's dagger to dominate and control him. Now, do I need to explain this one to y'all folks? Remember, sex is nothing more than a power exchange. Galadriel holding the dagger to Sauron's throat. She is taking what she wants, and then she lets him go. If you think this thing all the way through, you'll start to realize we're getting into Wonder Woman 1984 territory here. Galadriel is forcing Sauron, the most evil being in all of Middle-earth, to do things against his will. These people are stupid. Galadriel finds out how Rond is Sauron. <gasps> Shocking, I know. Galadriel lets Sauron go. Ideologically, Galadriel has to be shown to be in a superior position to Sauron at all times. She has to be in control, making all the decisions. That means she has to be the one that allows Sauron to leave, even when that makes absolutely no sense within the context of the story. By the time we get to the end of season one, we're well beyond the audience rejecting the Rings of Power's interpretation of Gladriel. We're into the realm of ridicule and mockery. The writers and the other people behind the Rings of Power got their feelings hurt, got pissed. And just like before season one, before season two, they telegraphed exactly what they were going to do. In addition to continuing to try to assassinate Galadriel, they were going to attack traditional feminine power and in the process emasculate every single male character within the show. In season two, Galadriel's not out there strutting around in armor. She's wearing long flowing robes, long hair in a flattering style, flattering makeup, warm light, Soft focus cinematography. They're trying to make Galadriel feminine, soft, and ethereal. The problem? They're a day late and a dollar short. At this point, referencing Kate Blanchett's interpretation of Galadriel just makes Morphin Clark look like a cheap copy, a counterfeit, a parody. Every time something to do with Sauron is brought up, Galadriel changes the subject, deflects, attacks, accuses other people of wrongdoing, openly lies. To further emphasize Galadriel's new soft feminine persona, she talks in a soft, breathy voice. 
And she's constantly using emotional appeals in her efforts to persuade people. They're trying to evoke traditional negative stereotypes of femininity. The lying, deceitful, manipulative woman. But again, she can't be shown in a negative light. She's justified in her lying, deceitful manipulation because of those stupid men. When Galadriel heads out into the wilderness looking for Sauron, when it would actually make sense that she'd be wearing some sort of armor? No, no, no. She's wearing long, flowing robes. Because symbolism. And as the mission progresses, Galadriel slowly becomes more disheveled, hair messy, clothes messy, face dirty. Galadriel is captured, put in a cage, chained. That cage, chained, filthy Galadriel is used as a bargaining chip between two armies. That same chained, filthy, bedraggled Galadriel is forced to stand to one side with a blade to her throat while other men fought over her future. A now bloody and filthy Galadriel is stabbed through the heart by a man, but chooses to throw herself off a cliff in one last act of defiance. A new Galadriel is reborn, clean and pure, having cast off the shackles and oppressions of the past, ready to become a new woman to face a new age, about as subtle as a dagger to the groin. It's supposed to be symbolic of Galadriel casting off traditional values, casting off traditional feminine power, and claiming a new power, a power she always knew she had in the first place. Randy, the kiss. What about the kiss? What about it? It's just Halbrand season one, rinse and repeat. Even though Gladriel is chained, Doogie Elrond has to approach her. He has to lean in first. Rule state, Gladriel has to be in the dominant position. She has to be the one who initiates the kiss. That means the entire series, Gladriel has been pursuing, actively trying to seduce Doogie Elrond. All those times Doogie Elrond said, get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm mad at you. And all those times he said, I'm in charge. You will do what I say. He just hadn't given in to the inevitable yet. He hadn't acquiesced to Gladriel's demands. Remember, sex is just about power. The moment Doogie Elrond leaned in for the kiss, he gave Galadriel his dagger. And now Galadriel can use that dagger as a means to control Doogie Elrond. Your attitude, why you choose to do a project, and how you do that project is made manifest in the final product. Most of us, myself included, would acknowledge Peter Jackson's adaptation of The Lord of the Rings isn't perfect. It has some major flaws. But most of us, myself included, are willing to forgive Jackson's mistakes, imperfections, because of his attitude, his obvious love and reverence for the source material. The Rings of Power wasn't made out of a reverence for the source material. It wasn't even made to be entertainment. It was seen as a vehicle to push an agenda. It was made out of hate and spite. The audience isn't stupid. They saw through what was going on very early on, realized this had nothing to do with the Lord of the Rings. This was a cheap, incompetent knockoff that very quickly turned into a parody. No one cares what they did to Gladriel? Because that ain't Gladriel. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about, and until next time, y'all be safe. If y'all are still here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time, and maybe consider becoming a channel member. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.